Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing. With the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 241, Baker Street Inquiries. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a stronger. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. A podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. (laughs) The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! And what a time it is. Welcome, dear friend, to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you are you inquisitive today? I'm very inquisitive. I'm always lifting up rocks, looking underneath them, moving one rock on top of another, stumbling over rocks, finding rocks, having things that are on the rocks. You would have made a horrible cat. <laughs> I say it is curiosity that killed the cat. Um, and, you know, this, this brings to mind one of my favorite quotes about the subject of curiosity, speaking of inquiries. Uh, I think it was our friend uh, Dorothy Parker who said, uh, uh, curiosity is the cure for boredom. There is no cure for curiosity. <laughs> so I hope to never be cured of my curiosity. Oh, me too. How nice to hear quotations from Dorothy Parker. What a great mind she had. Indeed, indeed. And of course, uh, for those not familiar, she was part of the Algonquin Roundtable, this wonderful assemblage of the New York literati and other types who got together on a regular in the 1920s and 30s in the Oak Room of the Algonquin Hotel, that famed hotel on 44th Street. The Baker Street Irregulars used to make their unofficial headquarters there during BSI weekends, and I think anyone with a an interest in literature from the early part of the 20th century uh, should be familiar with uh, the writings of some of the Algonquin Roundtable uh, literati. Oh, well, especially Dorothy Parker. Dorothy Parker, who gave us such great quotations as Beauty is only skin deep, but ugly goes clean to the bone. <laughs> and she said, she said, if you want to know what God thinks of money, just look at the people he gave it to. <laughs> she also said you can, she, someone asked her to use a horticulture in a sentence. And she said, <laughs> you can lead a horticulture, but you can't make her think. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Uh, and she also said, the first thing I do in the morning is brush my teeth and sharpen my tongue. Look out, world. <laughs> well, if you would like to sharpen your skills of curiosity, uh, the best way to do that is to follow the show notes at ihose.co slash ihose241. That'll take you directly to the landing page at the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere website, and there you'll find links to the books we're going to talk about today, as well as previous episodes and oh, other posts that we put up on a regular basis. And of course, there is the ability to sign up for email notifications when new episodes and new posts to the website come out. We encourage you to take advantage of that. And our Patreon 
support button is right there for as little as a dollar an episode you can help keep i hear of sherlock everywhere going and if you bump up the ladder a little bit to additional amounts well guess what we have thank you gifts for you and things to make it worth your while as if this content isn't enough really now michelle Burkby wrote her first book at the age of seven it was about a bunny rabbit it's, and the, the rabbit fortunately survived that book. However, over the next 30 years, Michelle set her hand to fanfic, romance, sci-fi, and ghost stories. And all of these endeavors had one thing in common. At least one of the characters ended up dead. In the end, she yielded to the inevitable and started writing crime fiction where she could scatter around as many dead bodies as she liked. Michelle's employment history has been similarly diverse. She's worked as a tour guide in a prophetess cave, as a library assistant, as a film extra, and at McDonald's. And in her spare time, she's acted, belly danced, and had a lot of fun at science fiction conventions. But her truest love has always been stories. Reading them, dreaming them up, and writing them. And these days, she does most of her dreaming in London. Michelle Burkby, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. Well, uh, it is lovely to make your acquaintance. And just to get everyone settled, and so we're all on the same page here, why don't you tell us about the first time that you met Sherlock Holmes? It's Basil Rathbone's fault. Um, they used to show these old movies on TV in Saturday afternoons here. And the Battle of Bone, Sherlock Holmes, came on when I was about 11, 12. And, well, I became obsessed then because it's the Battle of Bone, Sherlock Holmes, and he's very impressive. And then for my birthday, I got given a big collection of the Sherlock Holmes short stories. And I started reading those. And about the same time, Granada started showing the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes. And so you've got a combination of having the canon stories and having the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes. And um, I was hooked from then on. And I've never really lost my fascination for it or for him. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So the stories have really stayed with you. And did you read through all of the Sherlock Holmes cases when you got this compilation? Have you read all the 60 stories? I did. I read all the short stories and then I had to try and track down the books. So studying Scarlet, the Hand of the Basketball Sign of Four, they were really easy to find. For some reason, I couldn't find a copy of the Valley of Fear for about a year. So I found an old 1950s edition in a secondhand bookshop. And it's like, oh, finally, my collection is complete. And it was <laughs> such a special moment. Well, you've certainly put them to great use in these, in these two books. Now, uh, we should tell our listeners that Michelle Birkby's works are available on Amazon and wherever fine books are sold. Um, but I gather from um, looking that... Um, your books, uh, your first book, The House at Baker Street, is what it was called in the UK. It was published in 2016 and then published in 2019 with the title All Roads Lead to Whitechapel. But it's the same, it's the same novel, isn't it? Yes, the same book. It wasn't my idea to change the title. I don't have any say in what the title is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but I can imagine. I can just hear the discussions about the Americans. You know, the house at Baker Street makes perfect sense in the UK, but this is America. You know, <laughs> and you've got, you've got a Whitechapel in this, lady. So, you know, we've got to put Whitechapel in the title. I mean, that's a real seller. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But it's but they're terrific. They you know they really are, and you've got all the Baker Street characters, many more than you saw with Basil Rathbone. You've got Langdale Pike, and of course Mrs. Hudson and Mary Watson and Billy the Page and Wiggins and the Irregulars and Irene Adler and Mycroft. Um, how long did it take you to? What was the inspiration? You know that got you from enjoying the stories and the Basil Rathbone films to saying, hey, you know, I could write something like this. Well, there's two ways to it. Is I was a big fanfic writer about 10 years ago. I wrote a lot of fanfic, and a lot of it is still out there, but not under my name, so you can't find it. But I loved writing fanfic. And um, the more I wrote fanfic, the more I realized I was interested in the background characters. While all the heroes were having their shiny moment of glory, what was the person who was selling them coffee in the background thinking? So I got interested in that. And then... 
I read The Empty House again for about the 20th time. Um, and there's a moment in that where, if, if you think everyone will know the story, Sherlock Holmes's wax head is in the window 221B Baker Street and Watson is, is in the empty house with Sherlock opposite the road. And he goes, oh, my God, the head's moving. And Sherlock rather <laughs> brusquely says, yes, Mrs. Hudson's moving it. And I've always just thought, yeah, Mrs. Hudson's moving it. And this time I thought, hang on a minute. Right, she says, <laughs> Quite elderly housekeeper. She's in a corset and a big skirt. She's crawling around the floor of 221B Baker Street, moving this head, knowing that Sebastian Moran, who is a big game hunter and is used to firing quickly at moving targets, could be aiming at her at any moment. And she's fine with this. Sherlock's fine with this. Dr. Watson's fine with this. And everyone's very calm about this. And my, my first thought was... This isn't covered by the rent. <laughs> <laughs> or by the national health, yeah. No, well, no national health then. But, um, yeah. then, but I, then I thought, there's got to be a story there, a backstory as to why everyone's absolutely fine with her placing herself in, in, in range of a sniper. So then I started to think about a case for her. Mm, well, but more than just a case for her, you know, you, you've created some new characters, you know, with names that we know, but real new characters with, with personalities. So we should tell our listeners this is not a pastiche because Holmes and Watson make the briefest of appearances in, in your books. But, uh, you know, you've got Irene Adler and Wiggins and Billy the Pig. So how did you assemble your cast? Who, how did how'd you go about saying to yourself, who else should pop up here? Well, May Watson seemed obvious because you, detectives need a partnership and there is a line in one of the stories uh, uh, about people running to Mary for help often so I thought there's something there and the others they're just I mean Landale Pike he's just so fascinating and I just thought I really want to put him in and Irene Adler everyone writes about Irene I wanted to write my own version of Irene so I just cherry picked the ones I liked best and put them in there. And um, the books in the future that I'm sort of working on now, it's just I just read through the calendar and go, ooh, she's interesting. I'm putting her in a book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just kept on doing that. And of all of these uh, characters that you cherry-picked, and I think that that's a wonderful idea because that's where the passion uh, certainly comes from and the creativity, do you have a particular favorite out of all of them? And, and, and why? I think we're going to have to say Mrs. Hudson is my favourite because there's so much going on there. As you, you look at her, and she's this simple housekeeper to Sherlock Holmes. But, and underneath the surface, there's just, I mean, even in the canon, just look underneath the surface and there's so much to go on, so much going on. And she has this relationship with Holmes and she has all these relationships, but she's kind of on the edges, but also part of all the action. She's, she's intriguing, she well, she certainly is, and I think she doesn't get enough credit for, um, you know, being the backbone of so much of uh, the, the home life at Baker Street, uh, and and I would have to imagine that in developing this series and developing Martha Hudson as a central character, that you probably formulated a backstory in your mind as to how she became the Mrs. Hudson that we know today. Can you walk us through that? Um, well, it is in the book, so I don't want to give too many spoilers, but basically I had her as landlady of several properties, running her own empire of properties in London, getting a lot of money in, and then deciding she wants to cut down her life to be more simple because she's getting older and she wants a nice, quiet life. So she cuts it down to just 221B Baker Street, and she thinks, I'll have one lodger, a nice, quiet young man. <laughs> and then Sherlock Holmes turns up in the doorstep. <laughs> And she decides she doesn't want a quiet life anymore. She'd like a more busy life. <laughs> well, you did a lovely job, you know. Um, and the, one of the nice things about the book, too, is that is the way you introduce Mrs. Hudson's backstory. Now, you know, you have that sort of in your introduction, but you also have her in discussion and dialogue with another character in which, you know, she tells a very condensed two-sentence story about herself that really you know, locates her on the page. But how did you, what, what was your thinking? How did you pull off? I mean, if someone said to you, you know, we're going to do an adventure story here and the housekeeper and the landlady is the central character. I mean, did you like the challenge of it? 
I like the fact that no one really tells her story. No one ever... It, well, in the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes, Rosalie Williams, as Mrs. Hudson, is always there in the background saying, don't do that, or sort of like, this is a bad idea, or talk to the clients, and nobody ever listens to her. Now, I loved her, and I thought, it's about time someone listened to us. What I wanted to do was listen to these voices that are always there in the background, but no one's paying attention. So that when I started writing, I think, well, I'm just going to turn my back on Holmes and Watson. They've had my attention for years now. Turn my back and listen to everybody else and write down what they're thinking and doing and feeling. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a ter you know, it's a terrific approach. And one of the nice things now, without giving away anything, I think it's safe to say that because of the way the house at Baker Street is constructed, there is an opportunity for Mrs. Hudson, you reveal, to actually listen in occasionally to what's going on in the sitting room. I thought that was, that was a really lovely um, device, you know, and it's, and it's evidently suggested that Watson knows this has been going <laughs> on. So yeah. um, what was your thinking about, about, you know, the, the dynamics of the relationship between Mrs. Hudson and Watson as an example? It, it develops through my books as Mrs. Hudson becomes close friends with Mary Watson, but it was, well, not quite mother-son because he's not that much younger than she is, but there, there's a, a sort of re relationship there, sort of family relationship in a way, certainly a friendship and certainly a comradeship in them both having to put up Sherlock Holmes. So there's that <laughs> dealing with him between themselves, especially as Watson has moved out and it's Mrs. Hudson is left alone with Sherlock Holmes all the time. So there's that kind of comradeship, but he cares a great deal about her. She cares a great deal about him as this kind of family dynamic that they have between them. Mm. And, you know, this is, this strikes me as a really fascinating and intriguing way to look at the relationships. And it, it's not terribly different from the approach that Gregory Maguire took in his uh, novels, particularly, uh, or I should say most famously, with Wicked, where we look at the Wizard of Oz through the eyes of the two witches, the good witch and the bad witch. And it's, yeah, I mean, and it's it, obviously everyone is familiar with the the basic story. Everyone is familiar here with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, but to view their world and their adventures, even tangentially, through the eyes of Mary Watson and Martha Hudson, I, I just think it's a, a, just a lovely way to go about this. It's something I learned writing fanfic. I mean, when people start writing fan fiction, you know, you're 21 years old and you want to write some fan fiction, you write it from the hero's point of view. But the more I wrote about that, the more I thought, well, you can see that on the screen. I wanted to um, see what you couldn't see on the screen and write about that. Uh, so I became more and more interested in different viewpoints. Like, let's look at something we all know, but from somebody else. It's like... It's like seeing Hamlet from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's view, right. that sort of thing. It's it's interesting to see it like that from a different angle mm. and cast new light upon something. Mm. You no, know, it really does. I mean, when when you think about your experience with the Sherlock Holmes stories, do do you enjoy the sense? Do does a sense of adventure come through to you? And and do you think of your books as you know a Martha Hudson and Mary Watson adventure? I do. I do like the sense of adventure. I love the stories where Sherlock Holmes just cries out the game as a foot, jumps over the sofa, grabs the dog and the pistol and runs out the door. Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. <laughs> um, so, yes, I did want them to have an adventure. I didn't want it to be cerebral. I wanted there to be action because too often female characters are seen as either being complete kick-ass martial arts heroines, which is good. I mean, I like Black Widows. And um, but they're, all they're seen as like they sit on the sofa and they think. I wanted somebody who got into the action but wasn't terribly good at the action, so she can't do Boritsu, which I know perfectly well is a made-up martial arts, but she can sort of kick somebody between the legs, that sort of thing. <laughs> so I, I just I wanted them to be involved in the adventure, but I also knew they wouldn't be very good yet at the adventure part of it. But they're still like chases down the streets and running away and. Shot, uh, shots in the night, that sort of thing. Yeah, very realistic. And w when you think about 
the the setting in which you've placed them. I mean, obviously, there are the confines of uh, the time and place of you know Victorian London. Um, but what beyond that, from the Sherlock Holmes uh, influence of the Sherlock Holmes attributes, uh, perhaps, did you apply to these stories? Uh, well, there is, I mean, physically, I mean, I live in London, so physically I could go and walk around these places and pace out and discover how long it takes to get from places. But I also wanted to talk about the position of Victorian women as it's perceived and as it was, there's this theory that Victorian women sat on the safe all day, cried, and were seduced by people, or, you know, they just didn't do much. But reading through, I mean, just reading through Sherlock Holmes's novels, a lot of the women in those, they have jobs. They are divorcing their husbands. They're refusing to fall in love with Sherlock Holmes and running away to open a school. They're busy, active women of busy, active lives. And I thought, well, it's, I want to reclaim the Victorian woman as a busy, active woman running her own work and doing doing the jobs. And she's not sitting on a sofa all day, weeping into a handkerchief. So I was trying to work around that, that theory of what the stereotype is and what it actually was for a Victorian woman. Hmm. I was trying to introduce that. That is very consistent with what we see in the books. I mean, we don't stop to think about it all that often, but I think, Michelle, just the way you framed it there, that these are independent women. These are women of, of action and of, of a certain level of agency. I mean, let's face it, you know, women in those times did not have complete agency over themselves, but uh, given those constraints, there are a number of very strong and very independent women. And um, I, I think it makes great sense to pick that that um, bit of minutia up and expand it into this wonderful world of uh, Mrs. Hudson and Mrs. Watson. Mm. Yeah, it was great fun to do. Yeah, I mean, there are some brilliant women in that in the canon, and they deserve more attention than they get. Yes, they do. They do. But you've done it, you know, in a very nuanced way here. And I love what you said about reclaiming the Victorian woman and um you know you wanted them starting out on an adventure but realizing they wouldn't be very good <laughs> so you know it's um so you you know it really is extraordinarily believable but also what's happened here you know we can tell our re our listeners without giving away any spoilers in all roads lead to Whitechapel, which is uh sort of the book we've been the first book in this so far two book series of Baker Street Inquiries by Michelle Berkby. Um, what's going on here is that Holmes is dismissed very early on a less than candid client. And Martha Hudson and Mary Watson um, wind up essentially taking that client on. And this is a story really which uh, the menace of it is women are really being preyed upon. And I think women is prey. Um, you know, is sort of is sort of the direction here. There's this unknown menace. Um, you know, what was your what was your thinking about that? Because I think that's that's connected. I think in a way to the vulnerability of uh, women generally around you know in the 1890s in England. Yeah, I mean, women as prey is a popular story in Victorian fiction. I mean, just look at something like The Woman in White, something like that, or the home stories themselves. I mean, the Charles Augustus Milton stories has women sort of at danger from blackmailers. You've got women. You've got women at danger from forced marriage and so on. And Sherlock Holmes rescues them. But I thought it would be nice for them to be rescued, saved, helped by another woman who would not only help them but would understand what drove them into it. Holmes cannot understand why this client won't talk to him, but. Mrs. Hudson and Mary Watson, living in that world, knowing what the consequences could be if she spoke up, do understand. So they can come from a different place when they're solving the case. And they understand what it's like to be in a woman's world, in a Victorian woman's world. Holmes can only ever look in from the outside. I mean, even Watson, for all he loves women, he's got a certain view of women. He doesn't know what it's like to actually be a Victorian woman. So they've got that different angle. They can look at it and go, yes, I perfectly understand why she did that. It makes perfect sense to me. We're going to go and help her. <laughs> mm. Well, we are going to take a quick break here. 
And when we come back, we will continue speaking with Michelle Berkby about the Baker Street Inquiry Series. Stay with us. Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle have been topics of conversation in the world of literature ever since 1895. Wouldn't it be great to look through all those discussions, have all those articles, reviews, and commentary in one place on your bookshelf? Now you can, because the Wessex Press has published Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle, and The Bookman. All the pastiches, parodies, letters, all the columns and commentaries about Sherlock Holmes from 1895 to 1933, from the finest literary magazine of the 20th century, The Bookman, in one place, bringing back dozens of long-lost commentaries about the chronicles of Sherlock Holmes. Don't wait until this handsome volume is out of print. Get your copy of Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle, and The Bookman right now at wessexpress.com. We are back speaking with Michelle Berkby about the two books in a Baker Street Inquiry series. Uh, We first covered All Roads Lead to Whitechapel, which was first published in 2016 under the title The House at Baker Street. Its U.S. edition came out in 2019. And Michelle, you followed that up almost immediately in 2017 with your second book, which was called The Women of Baker Street, and the U.S. edition just dropped last year, and the U.S. edition is called No One Notices the Boys. So I'm, I'm interested in kind of the timeline here. I mean, you've, you wrapped up the first one, and then hot on the heels of that comes the second one. Did, did you have some sort of furor scribendi that was causing your fevered writing pitch here or did you did you simply feel that there was more to be said than you immediately had to get it out talk talk with us about how the sequel came about well um it was while i was still editing the first book um i went into hospital because i have a chronic illness i went into hospital and i hate hospitals just the entire environment the people all around me i got my friend to bring in some paper and a pen, and I started writing about people being murdered in a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was very cathartic. You know, there's always somebody in a hospital room that keeps you awake all night or something, so I thought, I'm going to murder them in print. <laughs> so it started because I was off sick for a while with this. So it was a very cathartic thing to write the hospital scenes. And then once I'd started, I just kept going and kept going because I was off by off from the day job for a while. So I had all day to write. And that was it. The, basically a catharsis of one situation, which also led to a lot of free time to write the next one. <laughs> so, I mean, getting sick was actually quite lucky. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope uh, you completed it upon leaving the hospital and didn't complete the whole thing while you were in the hospital. No, it was just it was just the first hospital parts that were written whilst I was in hospital. Once she gets out of hospital was when I got out of hospital. <laughs> good, good. Well, one of the one of the, in addition to Martha Hudson, we should talk a little bit about Mary Watson. One of the lovely things here in one of the many lovely things in your book is that you sort of fill in the description and personality really very cleverly about Mary. And in All roads lead to Whitechapel. Mrs. Hudson tells the reader a little bit about Mary. You know, she says, you know, Mary didn't fit the fashion of beauty at the time. She was slender, tall, almost as tall as Watson. She had a firm chin and a straight nose and an intense blue gaze. Masses of curly golden hair that firmly refused to stay in place, falling out of its pins. And she preferred, like Princess Alex, to dress in simple blouses and skirts with barely a bustle and usually wore a simple straw hat, often pushed impatiently to the back of her head. She had a mobile face that expressed every emotion she felt and every thought she had. She laughed easily, and she was clever. Hmm. How did you, um, how did you, what was your thinking about Mary? Because you've really created a lovely character here for her. 
Well, Mary, when you look at her backstory, she lived in, well, she was born in India. Uh, she came to Edinburgh at the age of 17, I believe, and became a governess, which is not an easy life. So she's been on her own all her life. Um, she's had to fend for herself. She's obviously intelligent. Um, there's a point in Sign of the Four where Sherlock Holmes makes a remark about how she could have been, she could have been very useful in the kind of work we are doing, he said to Watson. And then he says, but unfortunately she's getting married, so obviously she'll be useless. <laughs> <laughs> but I sort of took that and thought, well, Sherlock Holmes just basically said she'd be a decent detective. And I also the thing about Mary is that, I mean, this continues as the books go on, but she's got a scientific mind, and this is a time of great advances in forensic science. So she becomes very interested in the forensic science of deduction, basically. So she's she becomes the science part. And as for the way Mary looked, the sort of scruffiness, the sort of pushed that the hat pushed back and never quite buttons her jacket properly. It's just I always like people like that. <laughs> they just appeal to me. Somebody who's never quite got their jacket buttoned properly. I always think, oh wow, they look interesting. And that's why I had the look and their hair never staying up and things like that. That's why I have it looking quite scruffy. Mm. Well, those are lovely details, you know, and you're right. They give you a tremendous amount of information about um, a character. What, how do you, how do you think, uh, what, how do you think uh, about Mary and Mrs. Hudson in terms of their sort of evolution? Do you think their adventures change them in any way? Oh, yes. They definitely do change them. I mean, um, I can't give too much away about giving away a spoiler, but the things that happen to them, especially Mrs. Hudson, who does feel things more deeply, echo on through their adventures and influence her actions as they go on. So they do, they do change. I mean, Mary becomes more pushy. Mary becomes more engrossed in the science. She becomes closer to Sherlock as well because she and Sherlock will talk about the science and Mrs. Hudson will... She'll, she'll grow, she'll start to become somebody different and she she may not always like what she's becoming. That yes, there's definitely an effect. They won't stay the people they are now. They will grow and change. And this is interesting to me because we know, and as you were saying earlier, you, you read and reread The Empty House uh, some scores of times. Um, that is the story in which we learn of Watson's quote-unquote sad bereavement. In other words, when Sherlock Holmes comes back from uh, his three-year hiatus, Watson is now a widower. And it seems to me that there's a, there's a really interesting story arc here going on with the Baker Street Inquiry series where you've got this relationship building between Holmes and Mary Watson, and eventually we know that that relationship will become severed not only because of Holmes's disappearance, but because of Mary's eventual death. Do you have something mapped out in your mind for how this is going to play out and, and what we might expect in future installments? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, have the, I have certain scenes. I've, I've actually, I've been working on the fourth book at the moment, and there's a certain critical scene between Sherlock and Mary in that. And um, yes, they, they're, they're, they do become sort of, because I wouldn't actually say friends. She considers him a kind of brother-in-law in a way. Mm. And they do tend to work together. And there is some crit there is, oh, I can't say anything about giving away how it's going to end. But yes, I have certain scenes in my head. I have no idea how they're going to go out. But certain scenes are very clear in my head as to what exactly is going to happen. <laughs> but yes, that, that's all that's, that part's all that out. Well, that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, it bring, brings up a question. Uh, when when you do write these stories, uh, do you do it from uh, do you, do you approach it from plot and character, or do you do you have some scenes already pre mapped out in your head, and you just have to figure out a way to stitch them together? What's what's your style? What's your approach? Well, I'm definitely what writers call a pantser. I make it up as I go along in the first draft. When I start writing a book, I never know who the murderer is going to be. I'm always quite as surprised as anybody else. But um, when it comes, I often, I mean, it's the kind of thing where I'll sit on the bus and I'll daydream a scene and then I'll come home and think, well, how am I going to get that into a book? So I'll have certain scenes that, that we'll want to put together. There's um, a certain scene in uh, All Roads Lead to Whitechapel, uh, almost a particular line, really. 
And I, it comes quite late in the book, and I spent a long time writing up to that line because I was so excited to have that line said. Um, I think I'd be giving away too much to say which line it is. <laughs> but it was like, when I got to write, it was like, yes, finally. I've got to write that line. And so, there's so I do try and string certain things together. But I'll surprise myself when I'm writing it. I'll have a scene that I've seen very clearly. I'll come to write it, and it'll change as I'm writing it. And I'll sit there and go, this wasn't supposed to happen. What's going on here? <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of those writers who plots, I'm afraid. Well, that's lovely because, I mean, it's just as much a surprise to you as it is to us, as you say. So. Well, and, and for someone who doesn't plot, boy, oh boy, the plot, <laughs> you know, is really, uh, and all roads lead to Whitechapel, you know, it does everything that you want to do. To, to and with a reader, you know, in terms of twists and different directions and explorations and so on. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Mm. Excellent. So when when shall we expect to see books three and four hit the shelves? Well, that's sort of in negotiation at the moment. So I'm, I hope soon. I hope I, I touch wood, cross fingers. I'm hoping for next year or the year after for book three, but that's all in negotiation. Yeah. So all the people in charge are sorting that out. Nothing happens quickly in the world of publishing. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, with any luck, we've created a little, a little bit of suspense and a little bit of intrigue here for our listeners, and I'm sure the word will spread far and wide about All Roads Lead to Whitechapel and No One Notices the Boys. Michelle Berkby, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful story about your stories here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you for inviting me. It's been fun. of fun to talk to somebody like Michelle, who's a real world creator, you know, and what she's done with these characters is something that doesn't defy categorization, but it's not, you know, what some of our listeners might think at first, you know, this is a Sherlock Holmes pastiche, but really it's creating, um, you know, a very unique and interesting slant on the world of Baker Street. And as Michelle says, you know, it's like, like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead and so on. It's, it's, hey, what's going on here, you know, with these characters in the background? And what, what might they be getting up to? And she's really breathed life into them. She really has. And, um, you know, I, I think this, this different lens, this different viewpoint, uh, it's refreshing. And, and she clearly has, uh, you know, worked hard at it and worked long at it. You know, as she mentioned, she was doing fanfic for a while. What a great warm-up for, uh, you know, these, these uh, longer-form uh, books that go out to the public. So I, I think it's a, you know, fascinating approach to, uh, to Sherlock Holmes, something different, certainly. And, um, you know, if, if this is something that uh, resonates with you, well, you really have something to look forward to in terms of this entire series as it continues to roll out. MX Publishing recently launched the MX Audio Collection, an app with a series of interviews and other audio content, beginning with Lee Child talking about Reacher and Sherlock. There are many more interviews lined up for 2022, including Jeffrey Hatcher, screenwriter for Mr. Holmes, Otto Penzler, the founder of The Mysterious Bookshop and Mysterious Press, authors like Bonnie McBird and Nicholas Meyer, and yours truly, Scott Monty and Burt Walder from I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Every month, MX will be adding in at least four new Sherlock Holmes stories and some more theater performances. There will be more from the deductionist Ben Cardall, too. You can read more about the app and sign up for the MX Audio Collection at ihose.co slash mxaudio. That's all lowercase, ihose.co slash mxaudio. There's a monthly subscription option and an annual subscription option with a significant discount. And iHose listeners get an additional 25% off of any subscription you choose just by using the code iHose when checking out. 
A percentage of the proceeds of the app go to Undershaw, the school for children with learning disabilities. It was the former home of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who, of course, wrote many of the Sherlock Holmes stories while he lived there. So go to iHose.co slash MXAudio and use the code iHose today for the MX Audio Collection. Well, let's roll out the barrel for everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show. That's right. It is Canonical Couplets, where we give you two lines of poetry, and we expect you to guess which Sherlock Holmes story we're talking about. Well, uh, we expect everyone but Bert to guess uh, which (laughs) Sherlock Holmes story we're talking about. Because the last time we were here, if you recall, we gave you this clue. Rods and reels and baskets, and an evening bright in May, a daring, desperate man receives a censure for delay. Bert, do you not know which story <laughs> we're talking of about? I, of course I know what this is. This, oh, is. this is the case that takes Sherlock Holmes to Dartmoor because he's heard about exploding sporting equipment and a mysterious legend. Mm. This is the case Watson called... The sound of the basketballs. <laughs> oh, I could hear you dribbling all over your microphone <laughs> with that one. Um, no, I no? am sorry. It is not the sound of the basketballs. It is, uh, oh, let's God. see, we're looking for Shoscombe Old Place. Oh, Shoscombe Old Place, right? Rods and reels and baskets. Fishing. Everyone loves some good fishing. Well, uh, why don't we reach over to the prize wheel and give it a big spin. Watching it go around and coming down to land on number 28. 28. And that is, oh, why, it's our friend Howard Ostrom. Yay! Howard, congratulations. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, the Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. Now, Howard had something additional to add to his answer. He said, Basil Rathbone to Nigel Bruce in pursuit to Algiers about the fishing trip to Scotland. Bed in the brush with stars to see, bread I dip in the river. There's life for a man, a man like me. There's life, th- there's the life forever. Robert Louis Stevenson, my dear chap. Wow, how <laughs> lovely. How lovely. Well, Howard, we have a copy of uh, The Anticipations in Sherlock Holmes by Bruce Harris. Uh, We will get a copy of that to you before too long. And now it's time for this episode's canonical couplet. Here we go. Four years of subterfuge, a nation's secrets, plans take flight. But from this villain, there will be no glad hand tonight. If you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the title. If you are among all of the correct answers and we select you at random, you'll win. Good luck. And in this episode, of course, we have a copy of Michelle Berkby's, one of Michelle Berkby's novels, A Baker Street Inquiry. So it's uh, your choice. All roads lead to Whitechapel or no one notices the boys. What a great incentive. Wonderful. Well, I can't believe we've done this again, Magoo. It's unbelievable. I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I never believe anything I hear on the Internet. <laughs> well, Abe Lincoln says don't believe everything you read on the Internet. Yeah. Well, that's only because he kept hitting himself with with that shovel. But that was before they invented blackboard erasers. So, God bless. God bless. <laughs> well, we will be back here in the middle of the month with episode 242. Who will it be? Only our sponsors know for sure. In the meantime, this is the highly sponsored Scott Monty. And this is the completely public domain Burt Wolder. And together... We say, the The games games of foot. (laughs) The The games games of foot. foot.
You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs>